All right, we're going to talk a little bit now about the bread and butter line that we put in all the time, which is the right IJ central line, which can be used either for a central line or swan. Uh, everybody has a sternum. You certainly hope everybody has a sternum. So feel that sternal notch and then feel the mastoid. And what's in between them? Well, no surprise, the sternocleidomastoid. If you have nothing else to go on at all, if you go at about the halfway point, you're going to be in business. Can you use an echo to help you do this line? Yes, you can, and we do encourage it. Here we're going to do it just by using landmarks, but do not hesitate to use the echo to place these lines. You're going to feel your pulse. Now, one thing you want to be very careful about is when you're feeling that carotid pulse, you A, don't want to press so hard that you throw off a fleck of calcium and you don't want to press so hard that you cause a vagal response. When you press hard on that carotid artery, you really squish and flatten the internal jugular vein. So feel where the pulse is and then lift your fingers up. If you continue to press hard, all you're going to do is flatten the internal jugular vein and make life difficult. If the patient is awake, use a little bit of local. This is uncomfortable. I think it's always a good idea to use a finder. Some people don't use finders, but I think it's a good idea. I go with the old rule of if this were my mother. If I'm going to hit big red and screw up, I would much rather do it with a small 22 gauge finder needle rather than an 18 gauge. Once you see that you have some blood, then you say, okay, now let's go with the other needle. Some people use a catheter, some people use a hollow needle at this point. Either one's fine. Now one thing you want to do is you see that I'm following with the second needle, the needle that is following the finder needle. I have the exact same angle so that I'm going to head in the same direction, same incident angle, to find the vessel. If I have it turned off at an angle this way, you see it's at a big angle to the first one, and I'm going to miss. If I angle it the other way, I'm going to miss. So you want to be sure and lay it right along where the finder needle is. So you see I've laid it along the same direction as the finder needle, and I found blood. Now we get rid of the finder needle, we disconnect, and it's time to put the... Oh, uh-oh, must have hit the carotid. See the blood spurting out? You really don't want to see that. You want to see venous blood. But let's say you're lucky and you didn't hit the, the carotid. So now we put the wire in. Make sure you watch for ectopy since you can put that wire all the way into the right ventricle and cause some ectopy. Once that wire is all the way in, you say to yourself, oh, I'm in the right place, aren't you? Wrong. What you want to do at this point is you want to prove to yourself that you are in the right place. And how do you do that? You can see in my hand here I have an 18 gauge catheter with a green hub. What I'm going to do now is, with this wire, I'm going to slide the 18 gauge over the wire, and I'm going to take the wire back out, see what kind of blood flow I get. I'm going to hook up a little bit of extension tubing to it. I'm going to hold it up in the air. You see that? The blood is only coming up a few centimeters. That would correspond to a CVP of 0, 05 or 6. It certainly would not correspond to an arterial pressure of 120 over 80. If that were the case, the blood would go all the way up the tubing and spurt out the top. So I have taken just a minute out of my busy day to make sure that I know that that wire is in the correct place. Now that you've done that, you put the wire back in, and it's back to business as usual in the Seldinger technique. You make a nick in the skin. Here I'm putting in a cordis introducer, and I slide that all the way in, pull things out, and then, as with every other line, I aspirate out all the blood from it and flush the thing out. And then after that, we'll be ready for the swan. So we open up our kit and we observe sterile technique, as always. And when you pull the thing out, make sure that it doesn't bump into anything that's unsterile. Put the sheath on. Make sure you put the sheath on the correct direction. And yes, people have put it on the wrong direction. Again, make sure there's a lot of space between you and things. So you don't want to bump into things and contaminate yourself. Here we have now inflated the balloon at the end of the swan. Make sure that it inflates okay and make sure that it deflates okay. This is how we're going to float the swan out after all. It is a flotation device. So here we're putting the swan into the introducer. Uh, we get to 20. You see those two marks there? Each mark is 10, so we're at 20. This is the point where we would say, okay, inflate the balloon. And we're going to advance now. Once the balloon is inflated, you go in until you get into the PA. Ideally, you'll get there before 50. Certainly do not go past 50 unless the person really has a big heart. Let's say we get to about 45 or so, just leave it there. Once you've got it, you slide the sheath down and hook it into the little gizmo there, and that way the swan is protected and sterility is assured. 
Let's talk a little bit about when you're the tech who's having to hook all this stuff up, okay? There's all different kinds of hubs and you want to make sure that the yellow is hooked up to the distal. You want to make sure that the blue is hooked up to the CVP. It's worth uh, taking one of these out and uh, working with it a few times because there will come the day when you're on call and you have to, quote, be the tech. They're not always there, particularly in the middle of the night. When you inflate the balloon, make sure you use the provided syringe. It's only got one and a half cc's of air in it. You don't want to overinflate the balloon. And you are in business.